Yes, I'm sure everyone has heard by now that SeaWorld Parks and Entertainment out of Orlando, Florida has put a $3.4 billion offer in to purchase Cedar Fair Entertainment Company based out of Sandusky, Ohio. This news turned the amusement industry upside down and reactions both positive and negative came out of it, especially on many forums, while some of the financial websites welcomed the idea. Of course, everyone has their opinions, and for today's video, I'm going to try to keep my opinion out of it. I'm going to try to get as much fact out there as possible as I can related to this offered buyout, and then discuss what a buyout could mean, if there could be a counteroffer, or if a merger is more likely. Of course, it's possible that this offer could end up dead within the next few days, but this still remains to be seen. One thing that could also happen is another company, such as Six Flags, can also enter a bid. A few notes before we get started. One, please like this video as it helps us out against the YouTube algorithm. Two, please smash that subscribe button so you don't miss any more fun updates. We have tons of videos regarding aviation, travel, beer, theme parks, and more coming your way. Three, share in the comments what your thoughts are on the potential buyout, and wait until after the video is done to do so. There's a lot of good information in here. Lastly, I am a shareholder in SeaWorld Parks and Entertainment and a unit holder in Cedar Fair, which is a limited partnership. It is possible that I may have to vote on such a potential buyout if it were to make it that far. I will not discuss my thoughts on voting, and I am limited on what I can discuss here business-wise. This is also not financial advice, as I, and I will not recommend if a share or unit should be bought or not. I will leave the stock discussion, except for rise in pricing and financial models eventually later on down the road, out for these videos for the most part. Speaking of these videos, this may end up being a multi-part video series. The first one mostly discussing the deal and what could come out of it, and the next one or two could dive into the history of the two, and we can see how they have become what they are today. And, spoiler, they involved acquisitions and mergers. We could also discuss what a SeaWorld purchase Cedar Fair or merger could look like. This all remains to be seen though, so for now, let's treat this like this is the only video, and we will take the rest from here. Let's take a look at the offer on the surface. This is not the first major offer that involves either of these chains that will be brought up. So, the offer on the surface reads like the headlines. SeaWorld puts in $3.4 billion bid to buy Cedar Fair. This is a non-binding offer that was unsolicited. This means that either party can back out at any time, and that Cedar Fair was not previously saying they were for sale. Instead, SeaWorld just put the offer out there. This is also not a merger at this moment, and you'll see why I say that later. This offer is a takeover. This means that SeaWorld would take control of Cedar Fair at their offered $60 a share. Now, many people may be looking back at Six Flags' offer to purchase Cedar Fair in 2019, which was valued at $4 billion. I've seen a lot of channels talking about that offer and how Cedar Fair turned that down. So why would they accept one that is less? This is the focal point for a lot of discussions on a lot of amusement park forums as well. Everybody will go into what the pandemic did to the parks, and while that also will play into this, there's a bigger reason why the Six Flags one didn't go through. That reason? Six Flags offered very little in the way of cash, and the majority of that transaction would have been for Six Flags stock. It also appeared, seeing as the company was in a CEO hunt at the time, that they were more interested in merging the two companies together and possibly even adopting Cedar Fair's leadership structure. Of course, 24 hours after the news broke, Cedar Fair had denied the deal for being too low. Now, while $3.6 billion may also be too low, that too low statement was because very little in the way of a cash transaction would have taken place. Fast forward to today. SeaWorld's offer is in all cash. That's right, cold, hard cash, baby. And money does talk. Cedar Fair is always obligated to review such bids, and as we saw with Six Flags, that was denied right away. But Cedar Fair had announced that they received the offer early on February 1st. And here we are. New business week has already begun. It's been over a week. And no announcement has come. That means that they are taking this one really seriously. Now, one thing we must understand is the corporate structures of each company. SeaWorld is a publicly traded company with a board that calls most of the shots. This can be seen with the revolving door that has been occurring at the CEO position for the company. They were mostly owned by Blackstone, which is an investment management company that has assets worth roughly $619 billion under their management. Now, how did SeaWorld end up here? Well, it starts back in the late 2000s. SeaWorld was under ownership of Bush Entertainment a subsidiary of Anheuser-Busch. Yes, the beer company. That's why Busch Gardens, 
which is under the SeaWorld umbrella now, exists. Of course, speaking of acquisitions, Belgian company InBev acquired Anheuser-Busch, creating Anheuser-Busch InBev, or AB InBev. The agreement occurred on July 13, 2008, and the transaction was completed on March 13, 2009. It was for roughly $70 a share, or almost $52 billion. This was pretty much a hostile takeover. InBev immediately started looking at cost cutting. During this time, Anheuser-Busch prided itself in its SeaWorld, Sesame Place, and Busch Gardens parks. However, InBev didn't see the value in such assets, and they were one of the first things sold, along with all of the company-owned aircraft. Blackstone purchased Bush Entertainment for $2.7 billion on October 7, 2009. They already owned a partnership in the Universal Orlando Resort, as well as having significant interest in Merlin Entertainments. Now, remember, Blackstone is an investment management company. They focus on turning around assets for profit. They sold their remaining Universal assets to NBC Universal, and they also sold Merlin to the employees that wanted to take the company private. So, what did they do with SeaWorld? They decided to list it as a public company under the ticker symbol C's, S-E-A-S, on the New York Stock Exchange. The IPO occurred on April 19th, 2013. This was a way for Blackstone to get some of its money back. They still maintain controlling interest, however. Without going too much into detail, as we can discuss this in later videos, if they happen, the company's listing came at a bad time, as the documentary Blackfish started making its rounds. Now, we won't get too much into this, but this documentary has become rather controversial. There have been many people who have come forward and stated that the documentary did make some things up, twist some words, and altered some videos to push an agenda. We won't discuss this because it is highly controversial, and please do not be negative in the comments about it towards those who hold different views than you do. Either way, SeaWorld didn't necessarily handle it well either. Instead of defending themselves or even owning up to any mistakes that they may have made, SeaWorld decided to take the time will pass route instead. After a few years of treading water, no pun intended, Blackstone wanted out and sold its remaining shares to Zhang Hong Group out of China, while SeaWorld agreed to provide support for parks they wanted to develop in Asia. However, that will bring us to the almost present day. Zhang Hong actually defaulted on its loans in May of 2019. These were secured by SeaWorld Common Stock. The company had to turn over its shares to its lenders. SeaWorld then bought 5.6 million shares from affiliate Pacific Alliance Group in May of 2019. Pacific Alliance also ended up selling 12.2 million shares to Hillpath Capital, giving them a controlling stake of the company at 34.5% and leading to Scott Ross becoming the chairman of the board. Remember this name. It will become important when we discuss Cedar Fair. SeaWorld has since had polarizing views from many folks in the industry and outside, some still bringing up Blackfish every moment they get, others not happy with the direction the parks are going, saying there's been a significant drop in quality since the Bush Entertainment days. Other controversies stick with the company continually going through CEOs. One thing is for certain, however, the chain has been adding roller coasters and other rides at a rapid rate to try to turn public attention away from their animal attractions. The statement has been made that they will put animal education first and foremost, but that they will be focusing on diversifying their attraction offerings. This may be a big reason why they are interested in Cedar Fair. Now, of course, with a majority stakeholder by Hillpath and the way the board operates, offers like the Cedar Fair offer could be made as long as the board considered it strategic. And it is a solid strategic move, honestly. In addition, this could help the company's stock immensely, pleasing all stockholders. Now, Things get complex when we discuss the organization of Cedar Fair Entertainment Company, which does business as Cedar Fair LP, ticker symbol FUN, on the New York Stock Exchange. The LP stands for Limited Partnership, and Cedar Fair itself is a Master Limited Partnership. What's crazy is that the Blackstone Group actually operates as a Master Limited Partnership in theory due to its C-Corporation status. Essentially, as a publicly traded MLP, Cedar Fair is taxed as a partnership. It essentially combines the tax benefits of a partnership with the liquidity of a publicly traded security. The structure is set up to include general partners who make the decisions and the limited partners who contribute the funds for units. They are called partnership units and not stock in this case. Cedar Fair specifically has rights in its founding to include all partners voting rights based on units and also specific incentive distribution rights. So, 
Theoretically, anyone with just one unit has a vote in the company. And you'll see why later on. So why is this important? Because, for the most part, Cedar Fair, while looking at this offer, and they decide it's right for the company, may end up putting it to vote for all partners to vote on. That means anyone who owns a unit by a certain date can vote yay or nay if SeaWorld purchases Cedar Fair. The incentive is that everyone will get a good payoff if they vote yay. Of course, some may vote nay based on principle, or what they truly think is best for the company. But, wouldn't the general partners have to agree first? Yes! And there are some ways that we have to look at how Cedar Fair used to operate business, especially during their steady growth phase, to see how this could affect a chain-wide acquisition. This goes back long before 2006 when the Paramount Parks were acquired. Heck, it goes back before 2004 when Geauga Lake was acquired. The last park that Cedar Fair acquired was Michigan's Adventure. How was it purchased? With Cedar Fair stock, or partnership units. $27.6 million worth to be exact. In fact, Many of Cedar Fair's previous purchases also operated like this, while some also included cash incentives. Those units are worth quite a bit today, and the transactions were almost seen as mergers. Yeah, Cedar Fair acquired the parks, but then the previous owners got seats at the table. Now, they could vote in favor of this, but it would be a take at the money and run scenario. Or they could wait and see how Cedar Fair continues to recover out of the economy that the pandemic caused. The company has already reached its highest in two years. Of course, a lot of that worth was brought on by the SeaWorld offer, but they still continue to trend higher even before, with many analysts recommending to buy units. Believe it or not, do you know what stock has the best value in the amusement industry right now? SeaWorld! And that gives them a ton of leverage. But leverage, especially in buyout scenarios, isn't always the best. That's something else we might get into later on as well. Anyway, I promised Scott Hill would come back into the picture. Well, after Cedar Fair acquired the Paramount Parks from the CBS Corporation in 2006 for $1.24 billion, something that was bought in an all-cash transaction and not treated like a merger at all, Cedar Fair was facing some long-term debt. Once again, something they were hoping to leverage. But then the 2008 financial crisis happened, and they were also treading water. What saved Cedar Fair was how amazing the economy recovered at the beginning of the next decade. But there was a point in time where Cedar Fair almost sold the chain. In fact, it was more than that. The company had actually put California's Great America, which they owned and operated, but the land itself was owned by the city of Santa Clara, California, Worlds of Fun, and Valley Fair up for sale. Valley Fair was Cedar Fair's first acquisition, and what helped form Cedar Fair today. Shortly after this, in December of 2009, Apollo Global Management offered $11.50 per share, which was a 28% premium over market price at the time, to take over Cedar Fair and make it a private company. The deal included the assumption of Cedar Fair's debt, as well as $635 million in cash, leading to a transaction value of roughly $2.4 billion. Once again, this could have been an easy way out, and this actually made it pretty far. Now, who was a part of Apollo Global Management at this time? Scott Ross, the same Scott Ross that is now the chairman of the board for SeaWorld. Cedar Fair had planned to hold a shareholder meeting on March 16, 2010, with many majority unit holders unhappy about the takeover attempt. The meeting was pushed back to April 8 because two-thirds of the shareholder vote needed for approval wasn't secured. All in all, the deal was terminated, and Cedar Fair had to reimburse Apollo for expenses occurred. This also helped in the fact that Valley Fair and Worlds of Fun were removed from the market afterwards and continue to be a part of the chain today. California's Great America remained on the market, and after another failed sell in 2011, Cedar Fair retained ownership and also, just within the past few years, purchased the land from the city of Santa Clara, now having full ownership. After the failed Apollo sale, Cedar Fair adopted a unit holder rights plan as a preventative measure to help protect unit holders in the event that a hostile takeover would appear on the horizon again. To put it simply, Cedar Fair would need two-thirds of the vote in order to sell to SeaWorld if the board decides that's the path they want to take. They'll need to convince all unit holders to vote in their favor, or it simply won't happen. This is the biggest protective step that Cedar Fair has to its advantage in these takeover scenarios. Now, everyone has been focusing on the SeaWorld offer aspect. But, let's remember, this was a non-binding agreement. Either side can back out at any time. SeaWorld can even withdraw its offer if it wants to. Now, this could be a simple flex to show other chains that it is in position to expand, which we already know because they stated that last year, and to prevent any takeovers of SeaWorld as well. 
Oh, and for those going, how can SeaWorld offer $3.4 billion in cash when they couldn't even pay for their rides in 2020? Well, there's a difference between being able to pay and deciding not to pay. Same with the mass layoffs the chain did in 2020. They were trying to hold on to as much cash reserves as possible. Then again, this could also be leveraged. And that is something else we will get into once again a little later. But what we can remember here is that Cedar Fair can counter offer, either for higher value or to purchase SeaWorld. In fact, it is entirely possible that a merger could even come out of this. Everyone is focused on the present sale not occurring simply because Six Flags was denied for $4 billion. Once again, cash versus stock. The cold hard cash will always win. In fact, the market cap for Cedar Fair is around $2.8 billion. The offer is for $3.4 billion, a premium above both share price and market cap. Revenue that SeaWorld would probably be able to make very quickly. However, even at $3.4 billion, it does appear kind of low. Cedar Fair could counter with it being even higher. SeaWorld may decide to pull the plug at that point. But what if a merger is offered? Will Hellpath be okay with that? Will unit holders at Cedar Fair be okay with that? Well, I see this as a win if some conditions are met. One, the exchange makes enough money for the major players at each chain. Two, the management structure of the two are intertwined and Cedar Fair's leadership, as well as some SeaWorld leadership, can agree on a structure. Both have had their downsides recently seen through the pandemic, but both are poised to come back better than ever heading into the remaining part of this decade. So, that will wrap up what is hopefully the first segment in the series. The next one will discuss what a Cedar Fair buyout from SeaWorld might look like. We'll also discuss what it may look like if it's a leveraged buyout, if Cedar Fair purchases SeaWorld, or if a merger happens. Until next time, this is Brett from Universe of Adventures. Don't forget to like and subscribe, share this video, and let us know your thoughts about the SeaWorld offer to buy Cedar Fair in the comments section below. Head on over to www.universeofadventures.com, subscribe there, and check us out on social media, all listed in the description below. Thank you all, and until next time, Right on.